Today, Balikasan is a gentle, quiet place, with a pier sticking out into the end of the Lawn River as it flows into Castlemaine Harbour. Standing on the pier and looking outwards, there's a great view of the Dingle Peninsula. It's a tranquil place, like much of the Kerry countryside. However, a little over 100 years ago it was the site of a tragedy when three young men died after their car plunged off the pier. Nearby, a large monument marks their sad fate. A cross with the names of the three members of the Irish Volunteers who died there on Good Friday, 21st of April, 1916, the first casualties of the Easter Rising. Their names were Con Keating, 22, a Kerry man from Renard, just outside Carnsevine, Donald Sheehan, 30, from Newcastle West, Limerick, and the oldest man, Charlie Monaghan, 37, from Belfast. Although the general outline of what happened in Ballycassan is reasonably well known, many of the basic details are confused. Notably, the exact nature of the mission the men who died and their comrades who survived had been sent on. In a way, this is not surprising, owing to the secrecy in which the event was shrouded and the death of three of those involved in Kerry, followed by the executions in a few weeks of those who planned the operation, Sean McDermott and Joseph Plunkett. Before looking at this question, it is important to look at the two reasons for the particular importance of Kerry at this moment. The first is a more short-term reason. A German ship, the Aude, carrying arms for the Rising was expected off the Kerry coast, as was Roger Casement, though he was in a German submarine. The second reason was strategic. After much effort in the second half of the 19th century, a telegram cable was laid between Valencia Island and Kerry and Hearts Content in Newfoundland. This made Valencia essential in terms of communications between Europe and North America. It also resulted in a need for trained wireless or telegram operators. So between 1911 and 1919, Carsvine was the site of the Atlantic College of Wireless and Cable Telegraphy. Among those who trained here were Con Keating, who died at Balikasan. This type of training was politically sensitive, especially during wartime. In 1915, Atlantic College was actually discussed in the House of Commons. When in response to a question from Lawrence Janell, MP, at that time an independent nationalist MP, and later a TD for Sinn Féin, the Postmaster General, Mr Herbert Samuel, told him that two pupils have recently been excluded from instruction in wireless telegraphy at the Atlantic Wireless College in Carsevine. Unfortunately, no names or reasons were provided for this, but it's probable that they were involved in nationalist activity. Irish nationalist groups were well aware of the importance of the cable station in Valencia, as it controlled an enormous part of communication between London and the US. For instance, in 1867 the Fenians had planned to attack it. In 1916, the leaders planning the rising also had their eyes on it, but for different reasons. On Holy Thursday, Sean McDermott and Joseph Plunkett, with apparent help from Michael Collins, set the final touches to a plan to send a group of men to Carsevine to break into Atlantic College and steal one of the two Marconi wirelesses there. This was to be used to contact the German ship carrying arms, which was expected off Phoenix and Kerry on Easter Sunday. However, the plan was doomed from the start. The odd lacked any wireless capacity and was following an earlier schedule, so it arrived off Phoenix on the 20th of April when the volunteer leadership only expected it on Easter Sunday the 23rd. The following day, it would be in intercepted by the Royal Navy. On the same day, Roger Casement would be landed on Bannistrand. However, he would be quickly arrested. However, McDermott and Plunkett were unaware of this and made their plans to meet with the Oud and its load of weapons on Easter Sunday. A group of five men were sent down to Killarney by train. Dinny Daly, Con Keating, Charlie Monaghan, Dan Sheehan and Colm O'Loughlin. O'Loughlin and Daly were in one carriage, the others in a second one. As mentioned, 
They were to steal one of the wirelesses from the Atlantic College and then deliver it to a group of volunteers from Tralee early on Easter Saturday. Indeed, Sean Allen, who provides a detailed account of this, says that this was to be done before first light. Three of the men, Daly, Keating and Monaghan, were to remain with the wireless. Keating obviously was intended to operate it. Finally, it was to be stored at the home of J.P. O'Donnell. In addition, the mission may have had a second objective. This appears in some accounts, but due to the execution of McDermott and Plunkett and the deaths of Keating the wireless operator, as well as others later, this has not been properly verified. This objective was allegedly to misdirect British warships away from Tralee Bay by sending false information, thereby allowing the odd to land its precious cargo. When the party of volunteers arrived in Killarney, they were met by two cars. Apparently a password was supposed to be exchanged, but since these were the only cars at the station, the use of passwords was abandoned. Nevertheless, just in case they were being watched, Keating got into one car, while the other men walked a bit before being picked up. Both cars probably belonged to Tommy McInerney of Limerick. He drove one, a Briscoe sports car that only had one headlight. The other car, a Maxwell, was driven by Sam Windrum. The latter was a late replacement as the original driver was unable to make it. Apparently, Wyndham was made to take the IRB out by the party from Dublin. There's also some confusion about the ownership of the cars. Murray says McInerney owned both, while Shannon says McInerney owned the Maxwell and John Joe Quilty, the original driver replaced by Windrum, owned the other. The weather does not appear to have been good, as it was raining when they left Killarney. It was also late in the day, though in late April the days are relatively long. They drove via Beaufort, in other words, they remained south of the River Lawn and probably took the road that becomes the Annadale Road. Nowadays, the main road between Killarney and Killoglin is north of the Lawn, however, this was not the one they used. Things now began to go wrong. In the first car were Windrum, O'Loughlin and Daly. As mentioned, Windham was driving. Behind them in the Briscoe were McInerney, who was driving, and Daly, Keating and Monaghan. However, between Beaufort and Cologlan, the cars became separated and may even have taken different routes. Around three miles beyond Cologlan, the occupants of the first car realised that the other car was not behind them anymore. They turned back to look, but could find no sign of the others. Due to the urgent nature of their mission, they decided to press on to Carsevine. However, they were then stopped at an RIC checkpoint. Although they bluffed their way through this, shortly afterwards they decided to abort their mission. Essentially because, without Keating specialist knowledge, getting and dismantling the radio would have been impossible. McInerney and the others in the second car seemed to have reached Cologlin around half nine. They pulled in at Taylor's hotel to ask for directions. 17-year-old Elizabeth Daisy Taylor helped them. She told them to t turn left in front of St. James's Catholic Church, which was only a short distance away. However, when they came to this junction, they took the wrong turn. Perhaps this is because it is a triple junction. On the right is a small road that runs by the river. In the middle is the Ballycassane Road, and on the left is the road to Carsevine. In the dark, with only one headlight, making driving undoubtedly difficult, they chose the wrong road. Perhaps they thought the Ballycassane Road was the left turn. It's hard to say. They followed the Ballycassane Road until they came to the pier. In the darkness, they apparently mistook this for a bridge and drove straight ahead. Then, realising the danger, McInerney tried to brake, but it was too late. According to one account, the car actually came to a stop, balancing dangerously on the pier, with its front wheels hanging over the edge. Nonetheless, the occupants were unable to get out, and the car plunged into the deep and fast-flowing water. Tim O'Sullivan, who lived nearby, heard the car pass. He went outside, and hearing splashing and cries for help, went with the candle to the shore to signal the way to safety. McInerney managed to scramble ashore. Keating too seems to have managed to escape the car. He swam for a bit. 
but was then pulled beneath the waters. McInerney was brought into O'Sullivan's house. Other people soon arrived, as did the RIC, the police, although somewhat later. McInerney claimed that he was a hackney driver firing around bank, bank clerks. O'Sullivan realised that this was not true when he found a gun in McInerney's coat. However, he managed to hide this from the police when they arrived. McInerney was also helped by the intervention of Maureen Cregan. She had just delivered guns and instructions for Austin Stack and Tralee, presumably in preparation for what was expected to be a countrywide rising at that time, and she had just arrived in Colorgan. She bandaged McInerney's leg, which he had hurt during the accident, and arranged for him to stay somewhere safe for the night. The next day, the search for the bodies began. Sheehan and Keating's bodies were found quite quickly, on the same day. Both had guns and money in them, raising police suspicions. Monaghan's body would take much longer to be found. Indeed, it would only turn up in October. Since the order had been intercepted and casemen captured, the police soon associated the various events. On Easter Monday, of course, the Easter Rising broke out. This has tended to obfuscate the events of Balikasan, and perhaps especially the details of the operation. Meanwhile, the occupants of the other car tried to escape from Kerry. The only way open for them was over the mountains through the fabled Balakashin. It was a difficult journey for their car, but they made it most of the way back to Killarney before the car died. O'Loughlin and Daly then got the train back to Dublin. Windrum and McInerney would be arrested and interned in the aftermath of Easter week. In 1918, McInerney actually had his gun returned to him. However, he would die shortly after the truce in 1922. Bally Kassam was a tragedy, one made worse by what happened with the Aud and the landing of Casement. However, there was one successful mission carried out in Kerry in April 1916. Just before the rising began, a telegram was sent from Valencia to New York, sending word of the coming rising to John Devoy. Given the security surrounding this form of communication, this was not something easily done. Valencia Cable Station was surrounded by barbed wire and was under military guard, with admission being by pass only. There was also strong censorship and all messages had to be seen by a censor first. Messages could often be delayed by a number of weeks. In spite of this security, Sinn Féin had a number of supporters in Valencia Cable Station, while the IRB had at least one member working there, Tim Rice. His brother Eugene also worked there and was a supporter of the Nationalist cause. A few days before the rising, Eugene Rice sent a message to Heart's Content. It was detected by the post office censor or checker and reported to a supervisor. However, since it was so innocuous, nothing was done. It just asked if the person at the other end wanted to buy a bicycle. It was obviously a trial message intended to test the security. The real message was sent on 22nd of April 1916, on Easter Saturday. To send it, the Rice brothers got the help of their cousin Rosalie Rice in Kenmare Post Office. Rosalie was a member of Command Namon. Using an assumed name, Tim Rice sent a message in Kenmare via the Valencia Cable Station to New York. The message simply stated, Tom operated on today successfully, Margaret O'Sullivan. It was a prearranged message and was sent to John DeVoy's housekeeper in New York, letting him know the rising was about to begin, thereby ensuring that Americans would hear news of the rising very quickly. All three would be imprisoned after the rising. Indeed, Rosalie would be arrested again and imprisoned during the Civil War essentially because her brother was one of the commanders of the anti-treaty IRA in Kerry.